And we thank you that you are a gracious God. That you show mercy to sinners, for we need it so badly. We have turned from you. We deserve nothing but your wrath, your justice. We deserve nothing but to be given over just to ourselves and our own devices. Yet you have mercifully saved your people. That you have bought us as your church with the blood of your son. And that we are reconciled to you. That we are even now put on mission for you. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray again as we consider our nation that you have put us in here in the United States of America. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. We pray that peace and tranquility would be characterized by this nation so that your gospel might go forth, so that the advancement of Christ's message and his work would go forth, not the necessary the purposes of this earthly kingdom, but of your heavenly one, of the church. This is our greatest desire. We want to see your people all over the globe worship you. You've given us such a gift in this country for so many years. We pray that it would continue into that, that the gospel would advance and overcome the injustices of our earthly nation and advance the righteousness of your name. Oh, do this. Do this for not our praise, but for yours, for your good God. In the meantime, we trust in you. And even now we ask of you, would you help us? Would you help us as we study your word, as we look to you, to conform us to the image of your son and to strengthen the marriages of this congregation and of your people, that we might give you more and more glory and we might be more and more faithful to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And make your way to Genesis chapter 2. continue our study, our exposition through this book, and we turn to marriage as we're here in the second chapter, starting verse 18, looking at the perfect partner. We've been talking about paradise and what paradise is like, this perfect place that God has made for us to dwell in the Garden of Eden. And we talked about a perfect life that God has given, that God had given his very life to Adam. We talked about a perfect home. He gave him this garden, this paradise. He gave him the perfect and ultimate relationship, which is a relationship with him. And then we turn as well and we see here he's given a perfect partner. And of course, that is the spouse in marriage. Which makes us think about us, ourselves, whether we want a spouse or we have one. And what kind of spouse are we or what kind of spouse would we want to be? As I came to Christ in high school, this is the late 90s. Uh, there was a trend going around in various youth groups to create some kind of checklist of the various characteristics you should desire or that you might require of your personal spouse. The, the list of the characteristics for the perfect husband or wife for you. And I came across such a list online. I didn't have one, by the way. I came across such a list online from a young woman listing the various attributes of her future husbands, the things that she would like to characterize him. And it gives a pretty good flavor of the kind of things I saw in these lists, uh, as I remember from high school. Uh, So here's some of her list of some odd 25 things. Okay, number one, he must love the Lord thy God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love his neighbor as himself. That's a good one to start off with. Number two, he must, she capitalized, be a gentleman, open doors, Hold my hand as I walk up and down stairs. Help me put my coat on. Pull out my chair. I guess not from under her, but. (laughs) All that and then some. Number three. He must be a hearer and doer of the word, period. No faking and making, whatever that means. Number four. He must be intelligent. Number five. He must have a servant's heart. Skipping. Number eight. He must must be financially secure. How am I going to eat? She says, number 11, he must be attractive and keep himself together, clothes, haircut, workout, a very neat person in appearance, cannot have a temper, number 12, he must love to read, number 13, number 14, someone who's secure, she goes on, number 18, this person will allow me to be myself, weaknesses and all, number 19, (laughs) he must listen to me. Number 21, no foul language. Number 22, be positive in thinking. Number 23, capitalized with three exclamation points, neat. And number five, 25, 
Cooking is always a bonus. <laughs> That's it. So now for the singles out there, do you have such a list? And for those of you that are married now, did you have a list? And if so, how'd you do? <laughs> Some of the lists that I saw or I heard from my friends, uh, it appeared to narrowed narrow the marriage pool of potential spouses to supermodels that excel the excellent wife of Proverbs 31 or basically Jesus on earth. And to both extremes at these lists, and you just think, if the potential perfect spouse came along, meeting all of his criteria, why would they settle on you? Would they want to be with you? After Genesis 3, post-Genesis 3, there are no perfect spouses out there. Only fallen sinners. And so there are no perfect marriages out there. But in Genesis 2, we still see that God has gifted us with marriage. And it's such a gift to humanity. And it prepares us ultimately for this ultimate perfect spouse, which we will one day meet face to face our risen Lord Jesus. So as we turn to Genesis 2, this is the main idea that we'll see. God's abundant provision, it just continues throughout Genesis 2 as he's setting up mankind's life. And we see it here that God most generously meets humanity's relational need. So we have this need inherently by design for relationship. And God's going to meet it here most generously, not just to the bare minimum but he's going to make a huge list and meet all the criteria, so to speak, in marriage. And this, we see, prepares us for an ultimate and eternal relationship with God. So discover, then, the gift that marriage is for humanity so that you would do all you can to strengthen all the marriages that are around you and that you would also then better long, desire, and look to your coming union with Christ. So discover the gift that marriage is for humanity so that you would do all you can to strengthen the marriages that are around you. And so that you would then better along for your coming union to Christ, the church's groom. To see this play out in Genesis 2, we're going to see a few things. We're going to see in the gift of marriage, we're going to see God's assessment of man and his singleness. Okay, it's not good for man to be alone. So God's going to give his assessment. Number two... We're going to see God's helpful preparation. He's going to even prepare man to receive this gift beyond just his very need of it. Number three, of course, God's going to give the gift. God's going to give the ultimate solution for this need of man, making a, making a wife for him. And then we'll see just briefly God's gift, gift unwrapped, so to speak, where the, the wife is presented to the first man. And then we'll consider, well, what does this mean for us, right? Because this is Genesis 2. This is before Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, everything changes. All marriages, so to speak, have changed a trajectory because of what happens in the fall. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our marriages and how we think about marriage? So we'll get to that, particularly looking at Jesus' teaching in Matthew 19. Before we get there, let's set the stage and understand what Genesis 2 has to teach us about the gift of marriage. So firstly... We see God's assessment given. It's not good for man to be alone. We've come to recognize what a gift marriage is, what this particular pleasure it is that God has given to us. First, by recalling what he said about our singleness in Genesis 2. And it's that it's not good. That there's something incomplete about us that it was not good without marriage. Marriage meets a relational need that God put in us by design. But before we uncover how he's going to meet that need and how he's going to fulfill that, the first thing that happens in the text just underlines for us, underscores for us what our need is. And the need is to not be alone. By God's design, we were made relational creatures. We were dependent upon an intimate companionship. And God's gift for meeting that is marriage. So let's see that here. First, we see God's assessment. It's not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2.18. 
Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. It's not good for man to be alone. Not good. As one reads this account here in Genesis 2, the presence of not good would be shocking. Shocking. In the first place, the Hebrew in the original language, it's, it's throwing this in the very forward of the sentence. God said, not good. The first thing out of his mouth as he's assessing where Adam is in the Garden of Eden, he's in paradise, and yet something he says looking at it immediately prompts God to say, not good. Not good at all. What a contrast this was with Genesis 1. Of course, as we go through creation in Genesis 1, what's the refrain that repeats over and over and over again? This is good. This is good. This is good. And then you get to the end of day six and God looks at everything he has made and he says it's what? It's very good. So that's the context we've seen in Genesis 1. And then you hit Genesis 2, 18, pre-fall, right? This is before sin enters the world and God says not good. That's shocking. Everything so far had been good. So what could possibly be not good about this life for Adam in paradise? Well, it's because that he's alone. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Now, what does alone mean here? In what way was man alone? Because in a certain sense, he was not alone. For one, there were gobs and gobs of animals everywhere, seemingly. They provide or there will be. They provide a certain kind of company, though it's a very limited one. But even more than that, who was with God? Who was with man in the garden? God was to have a relationship with Him. Though there was an intimacy, intimacy there that was still missing. God didn't live in the garden permanently. He seems to come and visit to have fellowship with His creatures, namely His image bearers. And as we look ahead and see what God gives to meet man's aloneness, we start to understand something more about what it means that man was alone. That means there there was no female for this male. There was no counterpart in creation for him to interact with, relate to, to have this personally, creaturely companionship. One Bible scholar put it this way, isolation is not the divine norm for human beings. Community is the creation of God, and it begins here in marriage. There was no one like him as he looked around as a creature on earth. Man was alone. And so God was going to do something about this to ensure that everything that he had made would indeed be very good. So God's determination to meet the need in the second half of verse 18, right? God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So he's going to do something about this problem. And this language, I will make a helper fit for him, recalls to us Genesis 126, right? As God is moving into the creation week, what does he do? He says, let us make man in our image. Same kind of language here. I'm going to make a helper fit, compatible for Adam. Adam, the first man's alone. And so God's going to make a helper fit for him. This is going to meet the need. He will no longer be alone because he's been given a, quote, helper fit for him. A lot of study and consideration has been given. What's this helper fit for him? Of course, it's the woman but or the wife. But what does this mean? Well, first, just breaking it down, helper and then fit for him, helper. Helper is an assistant, one who gives general support, one who gives aid to another. That's what's inherent in this meaning, helper. One who comes to another's aid. In this case, the woman is giving help to man's lack, where he needs support in his loneliness. That is, she's coming to help and supply him companionship. This is the wife or the woman's role in creation, created to be the husband's aid and supporter. Together, they will then go and fulfill the mission God has given them, namely to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, to bring across the whole world the worship of God everywhere. Now, this need not mean as a helper or sh- and should not be taken to mean that woman is then inferior to man because she's a helper. This word helper is even used in reference to the Lord God where he helps Israel. And certainly in no way is the Lord inferior to his people. But in that role, he's taking a subservient role in the sense that he is 
helping. He's coming alongside and serving. And that's the idea of what the wife is to the husband here. And so inherently then with this word helper, it tips off for us and defines for us something about the roles that are in marriage between a husband and a wife. And we'll discuss this more in detail Lord willing, next week. But suffice it to say here, the woman was created for man to come alongside him, to help him, to aid him, and to support him. Like Paul rehearses for us in 1 Corinthians eleven nine, 9, neither was man created for woman, but woman was created for man. In particular, the woman was created, the wife was given to supply man's need for companionship, to eliminate his loneliness. That is, her companionship, and she comes alongside, is not simply to be a partner for procreation, though that's true, but she is to be a true companion. She's supposed to be in a relationship with him. It's much richer than broader than simply procreation. And why is that, or why should we see that? Well, it's because she corresponds to him perfectly. That's what's meant here by a helper, quote, fit for him. Most literally, fit for him. It's like it corresponds to him. It, it's like a mirror image in a way. Highlighting the compatibility that the, this woman, this helper will have with man. They go together. They match. She is so much then his equal. She matches him or in a sense will when she's created. Now they have different roles. One's a leader and one's a helper. But nevertheless, they go together. They are fit together. They are made to be one. So God sees man's need. Man's alone. And God knows the solution and he determines to do something about it. I will make a helper fit for him. I will make for him woman. I'll make for him a wife. But we're not there yet. Because before we get there, the Lord wants Adam to recognize his need too. Which is what we see. God gives this helpful preparation to Adam in verses 19 and 20. And really the preparation he's underlying for Adam, just fundamentally about him is this, that we are dependent creatures. Adam, you're dependent. You're dependent chiefly on me, but also on others. Because perhaps to our surprise, God wants us to really appreciate his gifts. And sometimes he does that in his goodness by withholding them for a time. That we would really appreciate them when they come. It seems to be something of what's going on here. Because if you look at verses verses 19 and 20... You see, God does not immediately fulfill man's need. So verse 18, right? God says, it's not good that man should be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. And then we see in verses 19 and 20, this occasion where all these animals are brought to Adam and he names them. And then we pick up in verse 21, so the Lord God caused. If you, my point is, if you take verses 19 and 20 and just excise them from the text, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Read with me if you would. Verse 18. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Skip to verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man while he slept, and he took the rib and closed up his place. And then verse 22, he makes a woman. So it flows nicely. Why does God put 19 and 20 in there? What is this about? Why did God make all those animals and first parade them before Adam prior to constructing Eve? Well, it's to teach Adam something and to teach us, right? To teach Adam that he is alone, that he is incomplete, that Adam himself is a dependent creature. He's dependent first upon God. And we see this here as God gives help to Adam as he names the animals. Because as he here names the animals, Adam, Adam, what is he doing? He's fulfilling this mandate God's given him from Genesis 1, right? Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God says, I'm going to make you in my image, mankind. You're going to be male and female. And when you are doing that, you are going to subdue and dominate and rule over the earth, which includes all the animals. It's actually namely the animals. And so now, Adam, he is actually naming the animals. He's exercising his authority over the animals. He's starting to fulfill something that God's called him to do in Genesis 1. But God doesn't just go, hey, here's your mission. I hope it goes well. God's setting him up for success in fulfilling his mission, right? 
Because in verse 20, what do we see? The man gave names to all the livestock, to all the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. He's starting to fulfill and walk out what it means to rule over the earth for God. But God set him up for success in this. Verse 19. So he could be successful in verse 20, exercising authority. Verse 19 reads, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. See, God is setting them up for success. He's lining up the animals, making them there, and bringing them right to him. And then whatever the man called the living creature, that was his name. Man still exercises his authority. He's still fulfilling this thing God has commanded him to do. But God is helping him right along the way. Again, it's not as if God just made Adam, plopped him in the garden. Well, I hope that goes well. Like many of you seeing pictures on Facebook or whatever when you are dropping your kids off at college. Typically, typically, you don't just drive up, unload the hatchback, dump all the kid stuff in the parking lot, and leave your student at college. Many of you have walked around with your student. You help them acquire their books. You show them around the campus. Make sure they know where all of their classes are and so forth. That is, if the student lets you and or if the university does these days. But you're trying to help your kids succeed. You want to see them do well. So you're going to walk with them through this experience. Same way God's doing that here. He gave man a mission, but he's setting it up perfectly so that man would be successful at his mission. Another way, just illustrating, Adam's dependent upon God to get to do what God has called him to do. In the same way, we are dependent upon God to get to do and fulfill this mission God has called us to. But part of us being successful at what God has called us to do means we're dependent upon him, but we're also dependent upon one another. This is what God teaches us even here in Genesis 2. God's teaching Adam that Adam must not just only be dependent upon him, but he must depend on others to fulfill this, chiefly as we'll see this helper, this wife. This is what God's teaching Adam in this exercise of naming all the animals. See God's help in showing Adam his need. Because he doesn't just give Adam help by fulfilling the duty for him, making it easier. God's teaching Adam something. He's teaching Adam humility. He's ensuring and strengthening Adam's sense that he can't do this on his own. As things stand, he needs help. Because as you look, verse 19 talks about God bringing all the animals to him. In the verse 20, we read, The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. And then there's this realization. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So as he scanned all of creation and he's naming all the animals, getting a personal knowledge of the creatures he's made, he realizes, wow, there's no one quite like me. There's no one that fits with me. There's no one that's truly my companion. I'm alone. And he realizes, or should realize, without this helper, without someone being given to him, he can't fulfill what God's called him to do. Because, of course, in the most just obvious sense, you can't be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth as one, as a single person. You need someone else. But even beyond this, he needs the help of community. He needs a relationship. He needs a helper that's compatible with him, fit for him. And so again, this casts Adam on God, the provider of all things. He needs God to meet his needs. And in this case, the need of a companion that he might then fulfill what God has tasked him to do. Ultimately, we are all dependent upon God to do what he's called us to do. And as he makes us by design, by the very design in us, he makes us dependent upon him and dependent upon one another to fulfill this mission, this task he's given. And this is true in marriage, of course, we'll see, right? But it's true in our Christian life too. We need the church. There's no such thing as solo Christianity in the way God made and designed us to be. And here, when I say We need the church. We don't need a building, though a building expansion would be nice. You can talk to the elders about that. But that's not what we need, per se. We need the people. We need the relationships. We need one another using our gifts. We need you to use your gifts. 
to do the one another's that are throughout the New Testament, encouraging one another to love and good works as you see the day approaching. This is what the church is about because we need each other by design. It's true in marriage. It's true in the church. Turning to Genesis 2 again in our thoughts here. God's teaching Adam that he must be dependent. He must be dependent upon God. He must be dependent upon others who will meet this need that he might be faithful. And so now we see God's solution realized. God meets the need. And he builds, is the idea of the Hebrew, he builds a woman for man from man. We come to God's particular provision for man to meet this need of companionship. And he gives man a wife. God, with caring attention, recognizes man's lack and then wisely helps to realize the lack, meet the need, and it comes in marriage. And this is what the gift of it is. So let's see this process that God does, verses 21 and following, to bring about this woman and see what this can teach us about marriage and its gift to us. So verse 21, the first thing, the Lord causes this deep sleep to overcome Adam. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, seemingly to prepare him for this surgery, this very intimate surgery that's about to happen. And this deep sleep's effective. Verse 21, he falls asleep, and so that while he slept. And you just notice as God's taking the initiative. He's meeting the need. He's causing the sleep to come. He's the one who's going to come and make the woman. But as God does this, as he's taking the initiative and he's making the woman, it's different than the way he made man. And it's different than the way he made all of those animals that he just paraded before Adam. How did God make man? Earlier in chapter two, he made him from the dust of the earth and then he breathed life into him. How did he make the animals? Verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and so forth. So he made them out of the ground. But as he determines to make woman, to make the wife, where does he make her? What's the source? It's man. Right out of the man is where she will come from. God does surgery, taking from Adam's side or his rib. Verse 21, the Lord God took one of the ribs right out of the heart of man, so to speak, and closed up its place with flesh. Now, literally, the text doesn't read rib. Okay? It says from his side or from his sides, side pieces, you could say. And the point isn't so much what actual piece of Adam was taken, but from where it was taken, from his side. And namely, it was taken from his very insides, the very heart of him. The part that makes woman was taken from the very innermost part from the side of man. And again, this just underlies their compatibility. They're made from the very same stuff. It wasn't as if she was made of some optional or distinguishable, distinguishable member as if you could cut off your hand and you could turn that into a woman. No, this was made from the most intimate part of him, from the very heart. And of course, this anticipates what's about to happen is that they will be joined together in marriage and they will once again be one because they came from the same one. There's a unity by design, and that's why God did it this way. He could have made separate creatures out of the dust and put them together, but he made one, and then he makes two out of them to bring them back together again. They're made to go together. They're made to be one. Of course, God then takes this rib or this part of man on the side and then makes it into a woman, Genesis 2.22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made or built into a woman. A construction project. But the point is, it's the direct work of God. She was not made separate from man. She was made right out of him. And in this sense, as she was made from Adam, she was made out of Adam. And in this sense, she then belongs to him and he belongs to her. They go together. Again, they're not separate creatures, but they're made to be interdependent. So then with the bride made, then we get to the presentation of the bride, the first marriage. The last part of verse 22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. God presents the first bride to the first groom. 
here in the garden. It's as if God comes down the aisle with the bride to give her away to Adam that they might once again be one. Now compare this to verse 19, which we've read a couple times already. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Now with the animals, God made them and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, but God brings the wife to the man so that he would marry her, so that he'd be joined to her, that they would be one. God presents the first bride and all of her human beauty to see how then Adam would delight in her, which is what we see in this next part about marriage. We see God's gift unwrapped. We see Adam's firsthand response setting eyes on his wife. And what Adam's reaction teaches us is that God is so good and generous as he gives this gift. He doesn't simply meet the need as of a necessity, but he meets it with exuberance or with abundance or with plenty. And it's evident on, you could say, the face of Adam or in his mouth in his response here. You see this expression of joy and delight at the sight of his wife. Verse 23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is clearly the first incident of poetry in the Hebrew Bible. He sees his wife and he breaks out in song, so to speak. Overcome. And he says, this at last, right? After all the animals had been paraded before him and he'd seen all these different parts of creation going, wow, that one's not like me. Wow, that one's not like me. That one's not like me. Finally, she's here. She's like me. Look at her. This is the idea. And he joyfully commits himself to her. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You're like me. I'm like you. We go together. I'm yours. You're mine. Again, just highlighting the generosity of the giver, God, to give such a good gift. And then this perfect match that God has put together of woman and man sets a precedent, sets a principle for all humanity from that time forth of this new relationship, marriage. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This ultimate, unifying, permanent relationship of marriage, joining them together. So we go back, God made us. He designed us to be dependent Dependent on him to meet our need. And dependent on one another in relationship. Specifically in marriage. Where God by design put needs there. Particularly a need for companionship. And he's going to fulfill it by design in marriage. And as we see the way, Genesis 2, he supplies our need in paradise we come to. This is amazing. This is incredible because you have an amazing, generous, gifting God. What a generous God we have. And giving us a perfect partner in marriage. In this case for Adam, a wife. Okay. I get it. This kind of blissful relationship. You know, a fairy tale story where a prince comes and kisses the princess. And they go off and live happily ever after. The perfect marriage. Okay. But we'll keep reading in Genesis, right? And you come to chapter 3. Things don't turn out so well. That is a perfect marriage makes sense in a pre-Genesis 3 world before anyone was a sinner. But of course, because of course then they were perfect for each other because they themselves were what? Perfect. Of course they could stay married. Of course they could be thankful in marriage. Of course they could have a happy marriage and so forth because the spouse and the other was perfect. And then we look at this and we say, my marriage isn't like that. My spouse isn't perfect, nor am I. How are we to think about marriage after Genesis 3? 
How should we think about our own marriage, our own spouse, who is something less than perfect, let alone ourselves? Or another way to say it is this. If marriage is such a perfect match, how come we see so many unmarriages happening? So many divorces, so many uncouplings. If marriage was such a perfect union, why are there so many divorces? To this, to think about marriage, let's turn to Jesus and look at his exposition of this passage. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Let's turn to Jesus' perspective on this passage in marriage, even in a post-Genesis 3 world, even in a fallen world where every spouse is a fallen sinner. First off, what we see is that Jesus affirms afresh for us that even though we live after the fall, what we see in Genesis 2 is still a paradigm for us. It's still the design in creation for us that is marriage, this permanent union This venue for our companionship to be primarily met still comes in marriage. Look what he says, verse 3. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered. So as you think about divorce, he goes right back to Genesis 2, pre-fall. Have you not read that he, or excuse me, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And, quoting from our passage, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. This is still true about marriage. God made man and wife to be husband and wife for companionship. To meet one another's needs, yes, physically and emotionally. That's why God gave you a spouse. To delight in one another. To thank God for one another. To be leaning on one another. To find one another as your chief helper. Your chief leader. Your chief completer. This is what God made marriage to do in creation. And it's still true even after Genesis 3. Where we're leaning into our marriage, first and foremost, is that place to satisfy our aloneness that we know, that we feel. Marriage was given and designed for this primary companionship and community. Of all the relationships on earth, that is precisely what your marriage is for. Do you lean into your marriage that way? Are you depending on your marriage to meet your relational needs? Or are you looking elsewhere? Because marriage was given to you for that very purpose and God's goodness. For your companionship, physically, relationally, emotionally. But we see further as we continue by implication of what's said here. Because we then look at our marriages and they're of fallen people. So How do we make sense of this? Again, I get this Genesis 2, Jesus, but how does this work after Genesis 3? Again, verse 6. They are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So as he thinks through the marriage principle that you leave, cleave, and weave to your wife, and you become one flesh, he then says this. What God has joined together... By implication, true about every marriage. What God has joined together, let no man separate. What's this saying? Your marriage to your particular spouse is no accident. Your marriage is not a mistake, no matter how difficult you might find it to be. God is the one who has joined you in marriage. Do you believe that about your union? Or does your mind wander and fantasize what it would be like to be married to so-and-so? Oh, it would be so much better. Or do you look at your spouse? You, you see how different you are. How fierce your disagreements are or can be. Or how, or how dull your relationship has become. And you wonder, wow, did I marry the wrong person? No. 
by the authority of God's word, no. What God has joined together, let no man separate. The bottom line is this. If you're married, God has given a spouse to you to complete you, to complement you, to fix the not goodness of your aloneness. In his perfect wisdom, God gave your spouse in your marriage as your completing companion and friend. Will you trust what God's word has said is good for your life about what's good and evil? Or will you go your own way and try and say, no, this is what's good for me? Will you be governed by your feelings and your affections or by the truth of God's word in this matter? There's much more we need to say about these things. But we turn and consider, well, what about for those that are not yet married? And those that want to be. If we see God so integral in this, why doesn't he give everyone a spouse who wants one? What are we to make of this? Well, as Jesus continues here in Matthew 19, he makes this clear, that this side of the cross, where we now stand, earthly marriage is secondary to your commitment to Christ. It's secondary. Marriage is no longer so integral to your life as a follower of God. And actually, remaining chaste and unmarried is actually extolled in the New Testament as a great advantage to Christ and his purposes. Just look at what Christ says here in verse 10. The disciples understand, well, if we get stuck in this permanent relationship, it's better not to marry, verse 10. Verse 11, and this is what he says, not everyone can receive this saying but only those to whom it's given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs, not literally, but in the sense of their commitment, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. This is what's primary, giving yourself to him. Well, what about the aloneness? We all need to understand this. Earthly creation marriage was never in the end, intended as an end in and of itself. God made marriage to go somewhere, to point to something, to remind you of something beyond and greater than itself. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 Therefore, again, quoting the same passage, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Then Paul gives his commentary on this. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying, Paul says, it refers to Christ and the church. Why did God ultimately make marriage? Yes, in an earthly creation sense to fulfill your needs. But in a more ultimate sense, it's just highlighting again your need for him. Marriage is all about you getting into that ultimate relationship with Christ. One day, every earthly marriage will give way to that greater marriage it always pointed to. Every shadowy marriage union will be evaporated by the glory of the face of Christ as his light shines upon us. This is the marriage we look forward to. Every marriage will give away to the substance it always pointed, the union of God with his people. So in the pain of aloneness, okay, either in your singleness or even in your own marriage, in the post-Genesis 3 world, God makes intentions for marriage, but in our sinfulness and the sinfulness of our spouses, they're not fully realized, are they? I think we know the aloneness that can even happen in a marriage, and perhaps in some ways it's more acute there. And the pain of aloneness, or just those times you just wish things were different. You wish you had someone. Christ is telling you, okay, just wait for me. Hold on to me. I'm with you. I indwell you. Christ is saying in the gospel, I want you. I'm preparing a place for you and me to be together. That's what marriage is to remind us all about. And your single devotedness to him your advanced payment into that heavenly honeymoon, when you see his face, will make it so clear to you that it was never a waste. There's no regrets in living fully for this one whose face you will see. 
It will prove its worth as you dedicate yourself in your singleness or even in your marriage. As you dedicate yourself to that ultimate marriage, every time it will be worth it. I trust that it will give some comfort to us in our aloneness. And also it equips us to be better spouses. The spouse that has that ultimate marriage on the forefront of their mind will be the best of companions, the best lover, the best servant, the best helper, the best leader. A lover with their heart fixed on the one who loved us in a way and to a degree that no earthly spouse can touch. That heavenly fixed lover, the one with that perspective, will serve and love their spouse all the better because that spouse will be first satisfied in God and in the marriage that's coming. And then they can truly give themselves to their spouse on earth selflessly loving like Christ has loved them first. A spouse fixed on Christ as their groom will need not first be loved by their earthly spouse to give love back. We love our spouse because our heavenly groom Christ loved us first with his very life. We don't need to wait for our spouse to humble themselves, to grovel at our feet that we would love them. We don't need our spouse to fulfill the honey-do list so that we can love them first. We don't demand our spouse, measure up, meet all these tick boxes, and then I'll love you. The heavenly fixed lover on earth will love them spouse just like Christ has loved us. May we do that for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of every marriage in this room. Let's pray.